Let's start from Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 18 to verse 19. Message Bible says, forget about what happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. This is prophecy for somebody here tonight. God says, I'm about to do something brand new. It's busting out. Don't you see it? There it is. In other words, what God is about to do is something that can be seen. In 2024, there will be no surprises. Listen, there will be no surprises. In other words, it is the things that we have seen that we are going to see. Are you listening to me? It may surprise all the people around you, but you. Bishop Oedeko said it so many years ago. He said, if we were not here by now, we would be surprised. <laughs> because we saw it. Hallelujah. You will see something different tonight. In the name of Jesus. I said, you will see something different tonight. See, see, God says, there it is. He says, I'm making a road through the desert. Rivers in the badlands. Hallelujah. Somebody say mega shift. He says, I'm making a road through the desert. Rivers in the badlands. Okay, I'm going to take my time subsequently to teach, but let me just deliver the message tonight. I have one warning and three instructions. Are you ready? One warning, three instructions. For the benefit of those who need to understand what's a mega shift, a mega shift is a total departure from status quo. A total departure from status quo. You may want to say it, a, a, a mega shift is a quantum leap. You may want to say it's a radical transformation. People that knew you before will look at you and be like, he looks like him, but he's not him. He sounds like him, but he is not him. I've been, we, we know him, but, but we don't know him. It's a radical transformation. I said I have one warning and three instructions. Are you ready? This is the warning. God said I should tell you, beware of assumptions. You have not been here before. He said beware of assumptions. You have not been here before. One of the major undoing of so many of us called adults is that we assume that we know what we are doing. See, but you've not been 40 before. You've not been 45 before. You've never had a child before. You've not run business before. You have not been here before. So stop carrying on as if you know what you are doing. Or perhaps you have been here before, but you are repeating the class because of assumptions. If you have been here before, it means you are repeating the class. Because last time around, you assumed you knew what you were doing. So you fell flat on your face. And listen, this is what I've discovered. Your God does not know shame. So regardless of your age, if you have to repeat a class, God will make you repeat a class. Because he's more interested in building you than in blessing you. See, blessing you is not a problem. As a matter of fact, you are blessed. But until you are built, you may not be able to maximize your blessing. So God wants to build you. And if you have to repeat a class, it will make you repeat the class. Let's look at Joshua chapter 3 and verse 2 to 5. It says, after three days, the officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people. This is what they said. When you see, and I need you to document the scriptures and instructions, because all of them are connected. He said, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Verse 4 now says, then you will know which way to go. Since you have never been this way before, but keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits. That's about 914 miles, I mean meters. That's far. And the Bible, I mean God is telling you, stop becoming familiar with the divine. Don't become familiar with the divine. Never let it get to the point where you become familiar. Many of us are already familiar already, and that's why this warning is coming. You're familiar with your man of God. You're familiar with the service. You're familiar with the worship leader. Some of us no longer do Christianity with expectation anymore because we are familiar. Ah, he's not that, he's not that guy. He's not that guy. And most of the people that God will use to lift you have become ordinary in your eyes because you have become what? You have become familiar. But look at what the Bible says. When you see, then you will know where to go. Okay? If you go back to verse 3, it says this was the order. When you see the ark of God, okay, the Lord your God, and the Levit Levitical priest carrying it, that is when you are supposed to move. Stop assuming that you know what you are doing. Go back to the text. Forget about what has happened. God says, I want to do something brand new. You have to what? You have to see it first. Don't move until you see. It says, until you see. Listen to me. Some people may need to wait till June. 
Because we told you to wait in October, you did not wait. We told you to fast in November, you did not fast. We made plans for five days, you did not plan. And you keep assuming you know what you're doing. If you're not careful, you will repeat 2023. So you may have to hold back and don't move until you see. This is what I'm trying to say to you. Your plan for 2024 will, may be, I am waiting on God till I see. That's a better plan than for you to carry on and you assume you know what you're doing. So if they ask you, what's your goal? To hear God. Amen. To hear God. See, because there's a difference between a God idea and a good idea. Oh, a powerful man of God I respect so much said it this morning. He said, he said, he said, when you are executing God's plan, success is not debatable. And the reason for the struggle is because what we are doing is a good idea and not a God idea. You are moving, but you have not seen. Hallelujah. When you see, that is when you will know which way to go. So what am I going to do to put myself in a position to see? Let's read verse 4 again. Then you will know which way to go. Since you have never been this way before, but keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Verse 5 says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. That's the key. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, God will not do until you see. God will not show until you consecrate. Second plan for the year. Goal number one, I want to see. I want to hear. Goal number two, so that I can hear, I need to consecrate. Hallelujah. That is the warning. Let's move to the instructions. The instructions are not connected. They are going to fly like stray bullets. The one that hits you is yours. Instruction number one, let God lead you. Let God lead you. Say to your neighbor for me, allow God. Say, let God lead you. Okay, let God lead you. What are you going to get from there? You're going to get direction. Direction. I said this to you on Friday, and this was the only thing I shared on Friday. I told you to be intentional in planning, but flexible in execution. Be intentional in planning. In other words, when you are planning, plan as if everything depends on your plan. But when you begin to execute, be flexible in the hand of God. Imagine if Abraham said, God said, Isaac is my future. This voice saying, sacrifice him is not the voice of God. Many of us are countering God, okay, in what he is saying with what he said. Who is going to deliver you? When you are countering the word with scripture. When you are fighting your instruction with past revelation. Who is going to deliver you? Everybody you speak to agree with you. What you are saying is the Lord. is the Bible. But yet you are wrong. Because you are standing with what he said. Not what he is saying. Say to your neighbor for me, be flexible in the hand of God. Be flexible in the hand of God. Be flexible in the hand of God. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 to 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Don't believe your own perspective. Don't put too much of weight on your own perspective. What did he say to do in verse 6? In all your ways, submit to him. Submission is not a marital issue. You will struggle submitting to a man when you struggle with submitting to God. And the people that don't submit to God the most are mature Christians. Because before we say anything, you bamboozle us with goosebumps. Oh, the Lord said to me, I know what I am doing. Hallelujah. In all your ways, not in some of your ways. In all your ways, submit to him. Listen to me. If anybody should know the mind of God, it should be Jesus. So when Jesus said in the garden of Gethsemane, you have the power to do anything. There is nothing impossible for you. Let this cup pass over me. But that moment is instructive because God did not even dignify that prayer with a response. Did somebody listen to me? And what God was through that incident trying to teach us is I'm not flippant like men. Regardless of who is involved, I don't bend my rules for you. That's why the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. Listen to me, if things are difficult for you, get off your eye horse and submit to him. Can you pray and say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. God, I'm confused. They call me daddy, but I'm, I'm lost. Okay, you have posed, you've been responsible in front of everybody. There's got to be a place where you can lay flat and cry and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I yield myself to you. Not my will, but yours be done. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, and angels came and what? And strengthened him. That is when Hebrews chapter 12 makes a lot of sense. For the joy set before him. 
He endured the cross. How was the joy set before him? Angels came with a conversation. I said, guy, it's painful to be separated from your father, but you have to drink this cup. You have to go through. Listen to me, there's something about revelation. It dispels doubts, and then it strengthens you to go through what you have to go through. Some of us, all you know is the God who delivers, but there is a God who strengthens you to go through. Is somebody listening to me? See, because it's not about you. It's not about your comfort. It's not about deliverance. It's not about breakthrough. It's about purpose. There's an agenda. There's an assignment for your life. And for it to come to pass, you have to become. And you don't learn by being blessed. You learn by going through. So sometimes God will strengthen you to deal with what you have to deal with because the better you is on the other side of the dealing. Hallelujah. I don't know who this is for, but in 2024, God wants to introduce himself to you differently. You have known him as a father, now he wants you to know him as, know him as a trainer. God wants you to know him as somebody who will put you through stuff. See, and let me say this to you. He doesn't explain himself. He doesn't explain himself. I like the story of Joseph, but I don't want to be Joseph. See, because the first night he slept in Potiphar's house, he felt like this was his calm. Okay, so the coat of many colors... Was this, was this people just goading me on? So the coat of many colors, all this fantastic experience in my father's house was a setup for me to believe that I am something. All the dream that I saw, my brothers bowing to me, all of that was just a setup. Where is God in the midst of what I'm going through? Read it in the book of Psalms. The Bible said God allowed him to be put in stocks. God allowed him to be what? To be shackled till his word came to pass. Stop asking where is God. He said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. The reason why you have not heard God is because you are not interested in what he's about to say. And he does not waste words. So until you submit, he will not speak. Did somebody catch that? Until you surrender, he will not speak. You've been asking, God, where are you in the midst of all I'm going through? And God says, you are not ready for what I'm about to say. All you keep praying for is deliverance. Yet I want to strengthen you to go through. Say to your neighbor for me, allow God to lead you. Instruction number two, stay connected to your tribe. Stay connected to your tribe. So I said, allow God to lead you. You need direction. Number two, stay connected to your tribe. You need what? You need emotional support and accountability. Okay? You need emotional support and accountability. I'm going to say some, some deep things tonight. Just, just follow me closely. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9 to verse 12 we know it, but I want us to look it with fresh eyes tonight. Two are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Falling is not the problem. Falling alone is the problem. Say to your neighbor for me, stay connected to your tribe. Tell another person, stay connected to your tribe. The Bible says, likewise, two people lying together or lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? Listen, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how competent you are, no matter how enlightened you are, all by yourself, you will still lack warmth. I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes it is better for you to be with another person that is not as intelligent than for you to be all intelligent and all by yourself. It is not good for man. To be alone. Hallelujah. So stay connected to your tribe. Verse 12 says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. And I know we've abused this next line. Because what it is saying is not what we have been saying. It says, three are even better. This verse is not talking about marriage. Because when we say three are even better, I say man, his wife, and their God. No, when he says three are even better, he's talking about your tribe. The more, the better. The more people that are like you, that you keep company with, the better. Hallelujah. If two will get a better return for their labor, then three will get greater results. That's what the Bible is saying. Three are even better. For a triple-braided cord is not easily broken. Now, this second instruction, just like in your secondary school, has children. Amen? So until I tell you third instruction, everything I'm about to say is still under the second instruction. And God said, I should tell you, don't let offense displace you. Because if there's anything that's going to disconnect you from your tribe, is what? It's offense. And John the Baptist teaches us that even with the spirit of Elijah, you can be offended. Amen? 
even with the spirit of Elijah. I mean, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. I don't know about you. I didn't know there was a Holy Ghost. Until my pastor introduced him, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist was that baby in his mother's womb that leapt at the greeting of Mary. John the Baptist, spirit of Elijah. John the Baptist was the one that saw Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They said, How did you know? He said, The one who t- told me to baptize said, The one I see the door. See, he, he, um, he, he, he saw Jesus, he validated Jesus. But when John the Baptist got into a tough place, he got offended. And he sent people to tell Jesus, Are you the one? I, I thought you said he was the one. Listen to me, your, your offense, your offense will make you call your pastor that guy. I mean, see, why will John send people to Jesus? This is your cousin. Come, you preached for him two years ago. Two years later, you are calling him out on social media. You are offended. He's not the only wrong person you know. Ask Ray Bullet. Because the church of 2023, we think it is a righteous thing to do. Just go in public. Listen to me. The church of Jesus is a family. And the Bible still says love, love covers. Not a multitude of testimonies. So you see, in the family, we are not in the dark as to whether you've done right or wrong. You don't have to be right to be loved in a family. You just have to belong. Are we getting this right now? And that's why in family, there is, there is love and there is accountability. Listen to me. All love and no accountability is a scam. Because I'm, I'm your pastor until I call you out. And when I say call you now, it's one-on-one. You understand what I'm saying now? One-on-one. And you don't want to have that. But you want my love. It's not going to work that way. See, but if you will take my correction, you will experience my love. I'm telling you the truth. The day you see me make any negative statement about anybody on social media, no, I have lost my faith. I've lost my faith. I'm no longer born again. I'm telling you the truth. I can mention names. Somebody asked me straight to my face. It's my brother. He told me, he said, he said, what if it comes out right now that your pastor was caught in adultery? I told him, I said, I will publicly defend him. When we get to the secret, we say, what happened, sir? When we get home, what happened, sir? But in public. Because people, at least, uh, oh, that's not my message. Sir. A lot of what we call righteousness is offense. Offense. And I just begin to pontificate. If, if they did, if they did, no, no, you're offended. Tell the truth, you're offended. You wanted them to listen to me. A lot of times, offense can come from the fact that you want to control people. So you are friends together. You want him to do something in a particular way. And I mean, if if Doctor Banji would have just become the kind of person I want him to become, but after ten years, I gave up. Hill City is the only church, no matter the number of people in the service, that somebody will reply, Pastor, during the message. Yeah, so city. And, then, and now he has proteges. Mr. D.A. to from the back. So, but guess what? That's love. It took me a while. I thought he was a rebel until I found out that's how he demonstrates love. Some other persons demonstrate their love with quietness. There is nothing I can preach from here. It's not like they don't agree with me, but their nature is not just to say anything. We're all different. See, but when I get offended, I will have the scripture. For why you should not respond when I'm preaching. Hallelujah. Somebody say, somebody say, don't let offense displace you. Don't let offense displace you. Hey, there's a second one. There's a second one. God said, I should tell you, don't be unequally yoked. Don't be unequally yoked. Because it is iron that sharpens iron. Evil communication will still corrupt good manners. You see, because when it comes to this love now, the fact that we are brothers does not mean we have to be close. Oh, are you listening to me? I won't call you out on social media does not mean I'll preach for you. I won't call you out on social media does not mean I'll come to your house. I won't call you out on social media does not mean I will allow us to be seen together in public. Okay? Because if you are not helping me, you are damaging me. When it got to this point in the revelation, I struggled. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me. I, I wrote it down. And I said, instead of preaching it, I'm going to read it to you what he said to me. Let, let's go together. He said, he said, a weaker person, through determination, can become strong by connecting with a strong person. 
But a strong person cannot make a weaker person strong. For them to interact, he has to drop his game. Strong people run after stronger people. Are you listening to me? Because the reason why some of us have become weakened is because we think instead of love, we think in the name of love, okay, I should drop my game so that we can relate. Iron sharpens iron. So if you are not iron, we have no business. As you go into 2024, you want to be effective. Iron sharpens iron. I fired somebody this evening. I don't know if he's aware yet. But I fired him. I don't have time. I don't have time. You know what I found out? When we get to heaven, you will give account. I will give account. I don't have to give account for you. If the guy with the four talent waited for the guy who buried his talent, he would have done nothing. Is somebody listen to me? No offense. But iron sharpens iron. Listen to what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, don't let anybody hold you back with sentiment. If they share your values, they will run after you. And he gave me a scriptural reference for it. When he told Elijah to go and anoint Elisha, what did he do? He went to the guy, saw him, placed his mantle on him. Elisha ran after him and said, wait, 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 please let me go back and let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye. Elijah said, what did I do to you? And he kept going. Are you listening to me? And what? Elisha went, took his oxen, killed, took the yoke, used it to cook the oxen and gave it to the people to eat. Packed his load and followed Elijah. Elijah did not wait back and do follow up. They share your values. They will run after you. Amen? Say to your neighbor for me, if you must come on this journey, you must be willing to run. This is what I'm trying to say to you. Anybody that is not running with you is weight. And the Bible says you should do what? Lay aside every weight. No offense, though. No offense. Wisdom. Gently. You get it? You, you will do it gently. Like Joseph and Mary. Do you understand? I don't know where you got this pregnancy from. But no offense. So I'm going to put her away. Mm, we're not going to make it a social media thing. People will not know we have broken up. They will even think I'm the father of your baby. But for revelation, Mary would have been a single mother. Are we getting it? But the moment revelation came, no sentiment. You are the one. I didn't know. Mary, let's go. And the Bible said he did not touch her till she delivered. Amen? The sons of Zebedee. Amen? Let's start from Peter and Andrew. I don't know, whichever part of the story you want to read, if you read it from the Matthew account, and Matthew says that they were what? Mending their nets. Jesus saw the two brothers and said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then he kept going. The Bible said they left everything and followed him. And he was going, he saw Zebedee, James and John, and their father Zebedee in the boat. And he said the same thing to them. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The Bible said they left everything. They left their father and followed. See, this idea of carrying people, this idea of pulling people along is slowing you down. If they share your values, they will run after you. Are you listening to me? If they share your values, they will run after you. The Luke account took it to another level. That it was not just that Jesus saw them and said, I will make you fishers of men. But that Jesus said to Peter, put your boat a little bit to the back. Let me preach through your boat. And then he preached and he said to Peter, let down your net for a catch. And he let down his net and they caught so much fish. They signaled to their partners, James and John, to come and help. See, Matthew was in a hurry. Luke gave us the whole story. They left everything to follow him was on the backbone of a major breakthrough. This is what I'm trying to say. They figured out what Jesus could do materially. Yet they followed him for purpose, not for what to get. Because a Nigerian would have stayed back with the fish, start Zebedee and Sons fisheries. Then after they sell that consignment, they look for Jesus and give him an offering. Just tell us where to throw the net. <laughs> tell us where to throw. And that's what some of us are doing. You don't want to leave everything and follow him. You want him to guarantee some things first before you come along. Have you noticed for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe shall not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to look at your Christian life. Was it not like God was running after you? God was wooing you until you gave your life to Christ. And now you are the one that is running after him. And if you don't pray for the next two weeks, nothing is going to happen. 
You will not knock down your door and say, you, you, you are wasting my blood, you are wasting my blood, you are wasting my blood. No, no, no. We are the ones running after him. You will call on me and I will answer you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with the whole of your heart. Stop treating people differently from the way God is treating you. I know somebody, you need to go fire some people at your employment. There are some employees that need to go. Some of you have domestic staff that need to go. You have some friends that you need to fire. Is somebody listening to me? But how do you do it? Don't forget, we started with love. No drama. Amen? No drama. No drama. Hallelujah. We have 11 minutes. Number three. Now, now, wait, wait, wait. Warning. I tried my best, but I couldn't cover all the 20 teams. Okay? Boost your growth with coaching. Because some people will take offense. I say, Pisha, where is my club? It's not about your club. It's about your destiny. Boost your growth with coaching. Pastor, what are you talking about tonight? I'm telling you what God will have you do in 2024 to experience a mega shift. Number one, the way of assumptions. Number two, let God lead you. Well, that's number one. That first one is what is a warning. Let God lead you. Stay connected to your tribe. I still had a conversation with one of my brothers yesterday, and I was trying to play truancy. As we were having the call, I wish he doesn't, I mean, I hope he doesn't watch this. I was, I'm not going. I don't have to go. And as I was telling him, I don't have to go. The Holy Spirit was telling me, you have to stay with your tribe. You have to show up. You have to be there. It's not a matter of whether you are going to enjoy it or not. That is what you have to do because you belong and you have a purpose in that tribe. I was telling my, my brother, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. At a point, he said, what can I do to make? I told him, I said, if you give me five t-shirts, I will go. <laughs> he said, consider it done. Because I didn't want to go. But the Holy Spirit was telling me, this is not a matter of whether you feel like doing it or not. This is a tribe thing. All right, that's about that. Now, boost your what? Boost your growth with coaching. So the first one is divine direction. The second one is accountability and what? Emotional support. This third one is discipline. Discipline. God said, I should tell you that giftedness does not lead to growth. That you are gifted does not mean you will grow. Until you embrace coaching, mentoring will not work for you. Let me tell you the difference. A coach provides external what? Pressure. A mentor offers inspiration and validation. Inspiration without discipline makes you a dreamer, not an achiever. And the challenge with so many adults in our days is that we skipped the class. We skipped coaching. And now we are into mentoring. And that's the reason why when your mentor is done with you, it's a social visit, nothing changes. Because the discipline that will make you actualize what they inspired you to do is not there. Because what supplies that discipline is what? It's coaching. Are you listening to me? Okay, let's read in the Bible first before I go back to football so that you will not think I've lost my faith. Esther chapter 2 and verse 10. Esther chapter 2 and verse 10. Esther had not told anyone of a nationality. There's nothing like I feel like doing it. There's nothing like all of us were gisting. I don't know when he dropped. This is discipline. She had not told anyone of her nationality and family background. Why? Not because she does not feel like it. Because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. That's what the coach will do. Discipline. Discipline. For those of us who got born again so many years ago, I'm talking 20, 30 years ago, what they called follow-up in those days was coaching. I mean, I had the person that would ordinarily be called my pastor, if not that he missed it somewhere along the line. He used to belt me for not reading the Bible. You come late for fellowship, they will tell you to face the wall and pray in tongues for one hour. Okay? One of our friends left Covenant University, said some of the punishment, one of the punishment they give them, you misbehave. Sometimes they will tell you to hand copy the whole of the book of Luke. How can you write out by hand the whole of Luke and no revelation will enter? Somewhere along the line, by chapter 5 or chapter 6, of writing out the book of Luke, you will have to read the book of Luke. Are you listening to me? You have to read the book of Luke. I made the leaders do that this morning. We are praying in tongues and we set the time. When the time is up is when the time is up. 
That's how you grow. See, it's not about how you feel. The reason why some of us are not where we are supposed to be is because we have allowed our lead, feelings to lead us. And because we are mature and we are adults, we never have coaches. Let me, let me read another one. Esther chapter 2 and verse 15. Esther was the daughter of Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin, Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Egai. This is mentoring now. This is advice. But the reason why advice could work for her is because she allowed discipline. No, she didn't allow. She did not have a choice. Because when your parents are dead, and the only hope you have is this your cousin that has allowed you to stay in his house. I don't know if your mother said it the way my mother used to say it. My house, my rules. You, you don't get to, you know when my, my son would ask me, um, I said, dude, he said, daddy, why, why, why? And you know, in the beginning, I would try to explain myself. Then one day, it dawned on me. They didn't explain to me. Because I said so. so because I said so. And then one day, he was running. I said, hey, and my mommy, I, my mommy. I said, you don't get it. I own you. I own your sister. I own your mommy. Your mommy. All of you, you belong to me. Then the guy felt like, <laughs> it looks like it's better to be on this guy's side. I'm telling you, one time like that, I told him to go open the gate for somebody. He said, why can't Teddy do it? I looked at him. I said, five years before you showed up, she was doing it. Now it's your turn to do it because I said so. When you are 16, you are going to drive. Well, from 9, 10, you are going to start washing car. Because what makes you able to drive fast is becoming familiar with the parts of the car through washing. And you won't be in my compound to say that it's child abuse. You will not be there or call it child labor. Yeah. We turned out right. I'm telling you the truth. We turned out right. When my mommy is angry with you, all this on face corner. We didn't have a naughty corner in my house. All the corners were naughty. <laughs> I mean, my mom, I don't know if your mother was like mine. Have you washed that place? Yes, I've washed it. Go and clean the windows. Uh, take this clothes, wash it. You just know you have done something wrong. They, they, they will punish you with duty. When I got married, I told my wife, I said, I've done my fair share of household chores. And some of us, we are like robots. We can wake up in the morning and clean the whole house without thinking. Just... Because they made us do it. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. There is nothing that can happen. There is nothing you can do. There is not much of excitement or tiredness. Pastor D does not go to bed with a dirty plate in the sink. Now, I mean, I mean that's fantastic. It's because every time I wake up, the kitchen is always squeaky clean. But it's not because she likes it. It's because when she was younger, her mother made her do it. Now it's a part of her. Headache, I'm feeling feverish, I'm feeling this one. You just say, uh, she's not thinking about it. It's just not normal to leave a dirty plate in the sink. But when she was younger, perhaps she was already dozing. Was your mother like mine? She will wake you up. In the middle of sleep, our own children of nowadays, oh, yeah, let him sleep. When he wakes up, he will do it. No, no, no. She will wake you up 2 a.m. The plate I told you to wash, you did not wash it. Oh, yeah, go now. <laughs> I'm telling you. And guess what? Sometimes you, now, when I finish eating, once I enter the kitchen, there's a way I see Pastor this face. I know if I don't need to, if I don't want to get into trouble, oh God, just wash your plate. Wash my plate. And then once in a while, I remember I'm the breadwinner and then what? Are we getting this? It's discipline. What I'm saying to you is at 35, at 38, at 45, you need a coach. If not, every year you will keep setting new goals and nothing will happen. The challenge now is what you did not allow your daddy and your mommy to do now, you may have to pay somebody. Because the best of coaches are not free. Amen. Look at verse, verse um, 15 again. The second part says, When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested. And she was admired by everyone who saw her. What we are saying is, this your success is not a function of your giftedness, is not a function of your passion alone. When you get to where you are going, it will be because everybody who is supposed to play a role, you have allowed them to play their role. And one of them is your coach. Amen? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't bring... I'll bring back our boys now. And for all of these young guys, 
they did not become who they became, but for their coaches. One of them who is not in the picture, who even was not in agreement with his coach, Joao Cancelo, said this about Pep Guardiola. He said, Pep made me look at football differently. I remember a period where our results weren't good. Pep said, we are going to play with inverted fullbacks. And I said, coach, I don't know how to play that way. I've never done it. And he said, I will teach you. After training, I will stay with him doing basic things that seem like child's play. Child's play. But I will go into the game and it all flowed, you know. I think the consistency he has as a coach, the mentality he gives his players, the win, that winning mentality, I've always loved winning. I've always been very competitive, but I think with him, I became much more than I already was. With him, I became much more than I already was. Let me ask your neighbor, who's your coach? I didn't say who is your mentor. And perhaps for some of us, the reason why you are not attracting the kind of mentors you need is because you are not attractive right now. What you need is a coach. Somebody who will tell you what to do and who will make you do it. Are we getting this? Somebody who will tell you what to do and who will make you do it. If you are going to grow, discipline has to go from external to internal. And it takes time. That's why coaching is necessary. 